very much. This being a serious conference, I decided to put on my jacket. <laughs> <laughs> um, both yesterday and today, on a number of occasions, the question was raised, uh, if I may frame it in my own words, from where spring the difficulties in actually this post-Keynesian or post-Kaletskian theory not being the mainstream economics. Why we still continue to frame our economic policies on the doctrines and the assumptions that underline those doctrines on the theories that have been shown yesterday and today to be either unrealistic or simply wrong. And I think the answer is, of course it is very complex, but I want to concentrate on some paradoxes and why I think why is this difficulty that we are unable to overcome, whether in politics and, and making economic policy decisions, or in the media, or persuading the public at large, that we are right? I think because very often it contradicts our common sense. And most of our assumptions, and often our conclusions, contradict common sense. I'll give you a few examples. Savings, private savings. In many ways, saving is a virtue. We save in, for the emergency cases or because we want to leave some inheritance for our children or grandchildren. But, and we need continuously to remember, we talk, and this is our reference point. We discuss the economy, which even at the top of the boom, very seldom fully uses its factors of production. There is hardly ever full employment, either of labor or, or capital. This is at the same time strength, and the weakness of a market economy. The strength because it can immediately adjust to changes in demand. And the weakness because this is at the expense of unused capacities and of unemployment with all the consequences that have been discussed, especially among our <coughs> colleagues, sociologists, which I think Heading them here was extremely beneficial to me, and I'm very grateful to the organizers of, the, of this conference for having this opportunity to, to, to listen to the reserve. The other case is financing investment. As a matter of fact, it's not easy to understand that let's assume for simplicity and open a closed economy with no government. and say the colleagues here decided to start new investment projects. And they came to the bank, the commercial bank. The bankers looked at the project and decided it was fully profitable. And this is a new, totally new greenfield investment. Okay. So they give them the first tranche of the credit. And they start basic uh, preparing the investment, uh, some groundwork, and so on. And these are the firms which do that job. They earn the profits. They employ people. Their earning profits are savings. And from incomes that were generated in the process, part is also saved. 
And if you go step after step, you will see that in such an economy, investment financed itself. This will not be the case in an open economy because part of the demand will go outside the country. This will not be the case as soon as you introduce the government because part of income will be taken away in taxes. But nevertheless, this is not easy to explain to the public at large. And also it doesn't help very much. It is not easy to understand that in contrast to what is used as a schwabische Frau, you know, the, 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 this example that, that when in crisis, when there is, your incomes are falling, you need to cut your spending. This is far not the case. Of course, in individual terms, if you or you or myself, we do not go to a hairdresser, the hairdresser will not eat her or his lunch. And we do not need to care. But this is not the case if we when we think in macroeconomic terms. Because your spending is my income. My spending is your income. Okay. So this is all which follows from the fact that a society at large, or an economy at large, is not just a, a sum of individuals. Were it the sum of individuals, there would be no room for macroeconomics or, or uh, macrosociology or, 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 or take it whatever you want. Uh, and uh, as a matter of fact, uh, what does it mean when every now and then you hear that the business cycle will improve when consumers become more optimistic. Does it imply that consumers will spend less or more? Of course the latter. Perhaps they would, should spend even more than they earn. So often those who say, who, who put forward this absolutely right idea that the business cycle will improve as soon as consumer climate will improve, do not fully understand the, the essence of what they say. The other thing is even more complicated, and that relates to what was mentioned today and also yesterday, uh, that inflation became the central core of economic analysis. It's no longer full employment and generating growth and investing in fixed assets. Why it is so difficult to deliver to the people two messages. One that relates to the fact that with respect to processing industries, prices are cost determined, not demand determined. This does not refer to raw materials, it doesn't refer to agricultural products, but for manufactured goods, the supply curve is practically horizontal. So as long as you operate below full capacity, and this is the basic assumption that we have to remember constantly, because this is a specific characteristic of the economy that we study. As long as wage rates do not increase at a higher rate than labor productivity, unit labor costs are constant. And then you need to allow for changes in cost, unit cost of materials. But on the whole, there will be no room for inflation pressure. Nevertheless, why is it that this 
central law, uh, the, the, the attention is so much focused on fighting inflation. Because with improvement in living standards, more and more people save. And of course, inflation eats your, the real value of our savings. So you will see that more and more often, your interlocutors or partners in discussions will be more concerned about the, their savings not losing their value than about the rate of growth and employment. But I think when we, when it was discussed, I think yesterday, yes, Professor Gilkin appealed about the, 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 the return to political economy. I think it is very important to take note of those political implications, <coughs> both of the fundamental assumptions as well of economics because most of the assumptions are of ideological nature just as much as of ideological nature or of value judgment nature are our assumptions that full employment is important and income distribution is important and now I want to address part of, of, of <coughs> what was uh, discussed in, in, in this last panel today, which refers to money. Yeah, you are absolutely right. Uh, when Lerner wrote his paper in 1943, and there was a preceding paper in 1942, uh, that was assumed that the country was sovereign with respect to its money. And of course, in a globalized world, this is no longer true. When Kalecki and Keynes wrote the theories, they addressed it to countries that decided about supply of money. And of course, as long as the principle, the basic principle of the central bank, which is the only institution that can print money, this is the only institution has that has the constitutional right for money emission, as long as they follow the rule that they supply money, pari passu, or in step, with demand for money, there is no room, as a matter of fact, for rise in interest rates and any limits of this type which of course doesn't mean that there are no limits to indebtedness because as soon as then of course inflation will start coming off those possibilities. So, uh, but I think, and this is the final thing that I want to, to say, the globalization factor is far more important than what I have already said. You see, the classical theories, in distinction to neoclassical, although the neoclassics like very much to call themselves the classics, but the classics were Ricardo, Marx, Adam Smith. Uh, we talked about changes in real assets and in real production. Okay. And uh, the main hero on the economic stage was a Schumpeterian entrepreneur whose main business was to invent new products, develop new, mar find new markets, and provide employment and introduce new technologies. When we talk about this creative uh, uh, destruction that was really rejuvenating capital stock and providing new machines and equipment that would embody new technical progress, uh, technical progress or new products. This is no longer so. 
when most of enterprises, and this is not only the case of Poland, this is the case of most of the OECD countries nowadays, that they engage, proportions are different between countries, as eagerly into financial investment, as in investment in active assets, in fixed capital, they are no longer Schumpeterian interpreters. This is a different world. And as soon as this activity is no longer about providing finance for new ventures or entrepreneurs who want to develop new pro projects or new products, but as it is a, a rent-seeking activity, then it's more and more like casino. Now when you build a theory, that theory should really be applicable to all sorts of, 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 of even marginally hard to imagine situations. Imagine all companies in an abstract country Okay, all your non-financial sector companies do no longer investment in fixed assets. But all they do is casino type operations on financial markets. Is such an economy feasible? Can it exist? Can we sort of continue that trend of ever rising share of financial operations vis-a-vis -vis normal uh, entrepreneurial activity. But when you start thinking about that, I think you will face a rather unpleasant conclusion that perhaps while so far, even within the post <coughs> economics, what we, how we try to account for globalization and financialization is doing this, that is, what is um, it? Yes, introduce patches that allow for financialization. But as a matter of fact, and I think it follows from, to some extent, from, from the analysis that is done by Lavoie, to some extent by Amit Baduri, by some others, perhaps we need to revise all our theories, to write all our theories anew. The building, the fundamental building blocks of which would be a company that is operating in that type of environment. Okay. And as was shown today by our colleague, to some extent derives profits from casino type speculation, and what will be the consequences for this? Also in terms of long-term stagnation. So when you <coughs> add up those two things, the changes in the modus operandi of the non-financial sector and the changes in the pattern of income distribution that we discussed yesterday. I think we then have good grounds for asserting that if we are in for a secular stagnation in contrast to what until present we wrote and learned about secular stagnation theories. This one seems to me to be mainly man-made, made by ourselves, a product of our own thinking, devising economic policies, and so on and so forth. Okay, this is on substance. And uh, now, uh, I would like very much to thank you, the organizers of this conference. We talked with Professor Polanski, we 
attend a number of conferences, each of us, um, uh, a year. And uh, it was a very successful, a very good conference, uh, in the course of which uh, uh, I think it was not only a platform for exchange of ideas, that, uh, but I think also we learned a lot. Among others, because maybe this is a college of arts in the late medieval sense of the term. So we had a representative of human sciences here, and not only of the economists, which surely very much added to the value of this conference. Thomas, thank you very much, and to all your colleagues for, for having this conference and, and, and the excellent organization of it. Thank you.